Welcome to another edition of the official Jets podcast powered by Amazon Web Services. Ethan Greenberg, Eric Allen here in the home studios for the foreseeable future. We have Neville Hewitt on the podcast today and a unique moment for us, EA, when Neville Hewitt signs on to do the podcast on at the same time on Twitter. We see reports that Greg Williams no longer the defensive coordinator for the Jets. Yeah, in fact, we're taping right now just a few moments before Adam Gase is going to jump on a conference call. And most of the questions that he's going to take is about the removal of Greg Williams. Uh, We'll have to see who the interim defensive coordinator is, because at this moment, we don't even know that. Uh, But yeah, life in the National Football League is tough. Greg Williams did a lot of good things with the New York Jets over the past two seasons, but unfortunately it didn't work out. We go back to what happened at the end of the game, Jets Raiders, just a really tough situation all the way around. The Jets try to get there with the pressure. Lamar Jackson's a one-on-one situation with Henry Ruggs. Ruggs, the first draft, the first receiver drafted last April undrafted free agent Jackson, no safety help. And Derek Carr was able to step up in the pocket and deliver. And man, a lot of raw emotions on that jet sideline at MetLife stadium. And we talked to Neville Hewitt about that. And Neville Hewitt's story is really cool. Undrafted free agent. He has a great story about his mother that I'm not going to share because that's his story to tell. So let's hear from the Jets, Mike linebacker, you know, Neville, before we continue on, I think your hand's blocking your face here. This is like 2020 in a nutshell. This is, like, <laughs> this is what happens with the virtual interviews and the virtual podcast that we can't frame you up with our own cameras. So thank you for adjusting your shot. You know, you mentioned pushing yourself past your limit. Can you take us through what your off season was like and what you wanted to accomplish heading into it and then how the pandemic affected what you wanted to accomplish? Yeah, I was um I was working out about four or five times a day at the gym. Um and the pandemic hit and we had to stop for like two weeks. So I actually um I was standing in the studio apartment and I started uh working out. I was had to do some of my workouts there until I was waiting for my uh, townhouse to finish getting bi- being built and um so I'm working out in there. I'm working in the little living room and stuff. I'm doing that for like two weeks. And then like we get back into the gym. And it's just, you know, my whole plan is obviously was like to push myself. So wherever I play, I was a free agent. So I was I didn't know where I was going to be. So my whole plan was to go in there and, and be prepared to compete with whoever is in front of me or whoever is there. And um, I, I, just my mindset going into every season is just being prepared to compete, you know, to win the position battles or whatever whatever the team wants me to do, just be prepared, you know, to win. And, um, I mean, it worked out well. Worked How out have well. you adjusted? Because uh, you are the Mike linebacker, and a lot of people would say early in your career, nice dude, hard worker, very quiet. But now you have to be the guy who's always talking. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it's one of those things where you have to step up, step up to the, uh, the role. Um, I was a well linebacker until I pretty much got here in uh, my third year, well my, fourth, well, my fourth year, once I got here in New York, I started playing inside more. And I mean, I love it. You know, it's, everything that's playing out, how it is, I actually praise for it, you know? So it is, it's a blessing to be here. You know, Neville, you were talking about working out in your studio apartment. For someone as big as you, who I assume loves going to the gym, was it difficult at first just being confined to your apartment and missing what would be like a, diff- a more difficult, challenging workout when you have access to an entire gym floor? I mean, it, it the whole experience was crazy to me <laughs> because I, one, I wasn't supposed to be at that apartment. <laughs> and then so when the, when the, when it happened, it was like it made it even worse. So, but it was like, like I say, things in life happen. And everything happened for a reason. And um life goes on so you just had to adjust with it and you know i know i knew the work that i was putting in before the pandemic actually hit i know i was at a really good place and i knew i had to keep on going keep on doing something with cardio core and once the you know once they we was able to get back and 
kind of get back to some type of normal. Because I lived in Georgia, so in Georgia been open. So once we opened back up, I was able to get back in the gym and, and finish off where I left off. So what were you doing in the apartment? What is it? Push ups, chin ups, uh, sit ups. I, I ordered all kind of stuff from Amazon. Did you? I had like <laughs> things you could do, curls and uh, push up, jump ropes. I, I got video of this stuff. It's crazy. I'm do you really? It. Yeah, I'm gonna put something together. I, I got a lot of videos from the off <laughs> <laughs> So a Amazon was a good friend of yours, and I'm sure the rest of the world, like myself and EA and this podcast powered by Amazon Web Services. How about them apples? Yeah, that, that was great, man. And hey, yeah, at good one, you find um dumbbells anywhere, you know. So mm -hmm. you had to you had to find what you could get. <laughs> yeah. You know, we I I could picture Neville taking a couple like gallon water jugs, like one of the big coolers and just curling those. I, you know, you see a lot of videos online, people getting creative. I figured, I figured if you're in a studio apartment and you realize like, Oh, I have to order some stuff and things got backed up. You have to get pretty creative. Yeah. I could see Neville pushing trucks. <laughs> yeah. I probably feel about, I wasn't doing that. I was running. Cause you know, in them, in them buildings, you have those, uh, them driveways or the, the garages where that go up. So I would go to the top of the, the, the top of the uh, garage and run sprints up there and jump ropes and all kinds of stuff. It was crazy. <laughs> How much pride uh, do you have as far as your background being an undrafted free agent? And now the guy playing next to you, Harvey Longy, I think you guys are such an interesting pair because you both play like it's going to be your last rep, the next one. Yeah. Well, one coming in the league undrafted, you see a whole nother side. You know what I'm saying? You always have to – you're always fighting. Always fighting, trying to get to that other side and get the same respect that the guys that are drafted because you could feel like you're playing at that same level or even better than them, but they're going to get more shots than you. That's just the reality of it, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Because that's who, you know, the team invested in. And it makes sense. So for us and, and for both of us then had – uh got crazy stories you know harvey was in a car accident um almost lost his life yep. and and me you know i come from a background where you know my mom uh, was incarcerated i come from come from nothing i went to junior college um then go, went to you know division one and i had neck surgery so and a lot of the teams passed up on me you know going into the draft and i had the opportunity to go to miami so um and I got hurt in Miami, and I remember being inside of these doctors' offices and, and having to wait to get cleared because I had a stinger that, you know, lasted longer than it was supposed to. And I just remember being in there and you know, and, and remember how I felt like I, all I want to do is just play football, you know what I'm saying? And we all want to get paid and all that stuff, but we all here because we love this game. We put so much into it, and you just want to play. And I knew – for, for me, every time I go out there, I know it's about, for me, it's about respect. You know what I'm saying? I've been, been in this league for a while, and every time I'm going out there, I'm trying to earn the respect of my teammates and the people I'm playing against. So um, that, so every time we go out there, I, that's what I tell the guys, man. Like yesterday, I told them, make a name for yourself. A lot of people are starting, and you probably wouldn't be starting if you were somewhere else. So just make the most of this opportunity, because you never know what game and what day is going to be your last play. And if you don't, if you don't give it your all, you're gonna regret it. You have such an inspirational story. There's so many ways we can go off of what you just said, and I know Greens has a number of follow-ups. I just before we get back into your story a little bit, mm -hmm. can I ask you what it feels like when you got a shot at the quarterback like you did against Ryan Fitzpatrick over a week ago, <laughs> and he doesn't know you are coming? Oh my goodness, <laughs> man! When I came through there, because I've been running that pattern a few times throughout the game, and then I'm running through there, and I'm like, I'm not getting there, but I'm getting close. I'm getting close. And then the final, when I finally got through, I said, "Oh, I got him!" I mean, it, it felt amazing because I, I was getting there all weekend practicing. I knew I was going to get one. I just didn't know when it was going to come, and the way it came, like it was beautiful. <laughs> Man, it really was. It was such a violent shot. Fitz is such a tough player himself, but I was like, wow. Neville, when you get after a dude, guys are going to feel it. Yeah. 
<laughs> but I know I feel I feel it the next day, so I know they feel it. <laughs> do you have going off of that? Do you have a favorite hit of your career? At one point, it was the it was the hit against. Um, at one point, it was the hit against the Bills. Um, what's that running back? Was it Chris Ivory? I had hit him one time, and he had did some type of like weird like flip, but. I don't know. Yep. That Lamar Lamar Jackson last year was was a good one, and but this year, I mean, it it was some crazy hits this year. I haven't even went back. I think you know what my all time favorite might be when I hit the guy from the Eagles and he had did that flip in the middle of the field last year. Yep, that might be, <laughs> that might be my all time favorite right now. <laughs> hey, let's get back to your mom for a second. I don't know if everybody is aware of your story. You you mentioned that she was incarcerated. What did she actually go to prison for? And then also, where is she and your relationship at this stage of both of your lives? Um, she went to prison for drug trafficking. Um, her and somebody was in the car. She was sleeping. Um, they, they got pulled over. And um, she had got, she had, yeah, sent, she was sent to like some crazy, 25 years or 30, 30 something like that. And then um, she was, um, about to come out and then um immigration put a detainer on her she got deported and we actually went to court once um won the appeal then after we won the appeal we were supposed to go back to court and um they moved the date and then this year we were supposed to go to court in february and um they moved the date again and then the pandemic hit so they moved it to next year wow <laughs> yeah so she she's in Jamaica and we, right now we're working on a uh, remodeling the house we just bought there. So, what well, going off of that, Neville? Like, what was your childhood like then, and who who was that person for you that it was a, a shoulder to lean on and and tried to and raised you growing up? Um, at one point I was staying I was still staying at the house in Georgia with um uh, her ex boyfriend at the time, and then. Uh, I decided to go to Georgia Military College, and things started getting kind of rocky. They had like seven Division One scholarships, and um, I still played basketball. So sometimes, after a while, I was at the house, and like the lights would be off because he wasn't coming there all the time, and um, the lights would be off, water would be off, and uh, I played basketball, so I take showers at the school, and school lunch, and and and. and School breakfast and lunch, that was my meals for the day. So I had friends like uh Riley, one of my, my good friends Riley. He uh used to look out for me, him and his mom, and I was dating this girl. Her mom kind of found out about my situation and she kind of started helping me out. And then I got my friend uh Grady Jarrett uh that plays for the Falcons. Um he started helping me. he looked out for me a lot. His family looked out for me a lot. And um like like when I graduated, I stayed over there for like two weeks until I went to college. Once I went to Georgia Military College, and my grandmother was also there and uh, looked out for me, took care of me. I had other friends, my friend Mike, and I got a lot of people that a lot of people came in and helped me out, man. And I, you know, that's why I say life goes on, man. Stuff happens, and you just got to keep going. Yeah, what have you learned from your mom throughout this whole process? What it's been like that everything that you guys have gone through together. Man, my mom's so positive and, and stuff like she just. She's positive, man. She's just always uplifting. She always, the one thing I learned about my mom is um, she always told me, if you're going to do something, always do your best at it. And then um, she always trying to help people. So for me, I always look at, my thing is I always, now that the more I learn, the more I want to teach people younger than me, you know, what I'm learning. And that way they don't fall into what the people I seen when I was growing up, you know, what they was doing just change change the mindset of the young the next generation so you know whether whenever whatever is saving your money or finding a trade or something that you're good at and you know going after that and and don't fall into the trap that's out here you, you got to use that platform man you're so positive and you have always put your head down and just worked really hard to get to this point and i know you also, Neville, have reached a point in your career where you're not content either. With that being said, how would you describe this season if somebody hadn't seen you in a long time and said, Neville, 
what's been going on with the Jets this year? Man, it's – when you look at us, man, we came here with a lot of people that was here, a lot of trades done happened, a lot of, you know, people got cut. Um, you know, a lot of young – a lot of younger guys had to step up. And um, we've been in games that I feel like we should have won. Um, we had – like sometimes there's a call or two that you may want back. There's there's a player or two that the players may want back. Um, and for some reason we just – We've been falling very short. We've been falling short week after week after week, and it's frustrating. And um, I don't really know what what the main problem is because you know you, you you try to call the problem, you start pointing fingers and stuff like that. It's collectively we haven't done it as a as an organization. You know what I'm saying? And everybody's involved, so we we just haven't got it done. And you know we got four more times to try to you know. Get four wins, you know. Go one at a time. You never, you, never, you can, you can only control what you can, can control, and you know, collectively we haven't got it done. Have you ever felt like you did yesterday on the football field after the Raiders complete a pass to Henry Ruggs in the final seconds, and they take away your first victory of the season? Have you ever felt like that coming off the field before? Because you were actually on the field for that play, and you were very near Derek Carr yourself, but just the feeling of laying everything on the field and everything that you guys have put out there together and hung together, and then it wasn't to be. Yeah, I mean, it, it was frustrating, um, and I know a lot of people questioned, like, that last play and what, we, what was going on and stuff like that. For me, when I was out there, I, I actually was out there and, and – I thought about checking um, to something, and at the time I was like, you know what? Let's try to get there. You know, I was close to getting the sack. I was close to getting them, but he stepped up and, and threw it up. And you know, most of us would, would, would say we should have been in something in a different call. But I don't question our call. I don't question uh, G Dub's decision decision on that last play. He wanted to get after him, and that's what we we tried to do. And they end up um, they end up throwing it throwing it up for a touchdown. You know, emotionally, though, Neville, can you just kind of take us what that's like when the offense comes back from a deficit, puts you guys on top, and then you think you have it in the bag, and then on what was essentially the last play, the the air is sucked out from the team? It sucks, man, because um, I know I know how hard, like, we've been waiting for our offense to, to, to do the things that they've been doing recently, man, putting these points up, moving the ball, and – those young guys that came in and was running the ball so well yesterday and the receivers, you know, receivers tight, like collectively, you know, everybody put work in and, 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 you know, in my heart, you know what I'm saying? We supposed to win that game. There's no question that we come off that field with a win. And, it, and you know, it, it's frustrating because we all know that it should have went another way. So it, it's just like, it, it, it makes it hard for me to continue to like go in there and tell guys, you know, keep working hard, keep doing this. But at the end of the day, my mindset is you gotta have you gotta have goals, man. Whatever your goal is, whatever your why is, you just keep coming, you keep getting better, keep working on your game, keep getting better each week, and you know it's gonna work out for you. You know what I'm saying? You can't. You can only control what you can. In control. Great stuff from Neville Hewitt as advertised. And this wouldn't be a podcast if we didn't have Bart Scott on for our Victorinox Swiss Army Knife player of the game segment. And we'll hear from him in a minute. But Jet Seahawks, when you look at it on paper, Seahawks very daunting offense. And the Jets secondaries had its struggles the past few weeks. Last week it was Darren Waller. The week before that, or a couple weeks before that, it was Keenan Allen. Jacoby Myers had a good game against this Jets defense. Now they're going to go up against DK Metcalf, Tyler Lockett, and of course someone that is on the Seahawks defense that Sam Darnold will be seeing a lot of is someone that he saw a lot of in practice the previous couple of years, Jamal Adams. Yeah, when I think about Jets Seahawks, these teams are going to be tied for a couple seasons, the Seahawks make that trade before training camp because they're going for it. They have one of the league's marquee players at the quarterback position in Russell Wilson. You just talked about his weapons on the defensive side of the ball. They had to get better. And 
Adams is one of the most unique defenders in the NFL because you could make an argument that he's a positionless player. Yeah, he's listed as a safety, but a lot of times he is a linebacker and then they'll move him in the slot. And uh, he's such an effective blitzer. Didn't work out here for Adams and the New York Jets. That trade, Joe Douglas, though, think about the return as we look ahead to January and beyond, especially with that draft. The Jets have two first round picks now in 2021 and 2022. Their first pick, their pick in 2021. It's going to be very early. We'll have to see where the Seahawks finish up. But we think about the draft capital that Joe Douglas has now to address a lot of the needs that the Jets have moving forward, the financial flexibility that he has heading into the offseason. He'll have an opportunity to build this team, whereas Jamal Adams out there on the West Coast, he's definitely going to be playing for a ring this year. It's going to be interesting to see where the Seahawks team does finish up in the NFC. Ethan, when you look at the NFC, where do you think Seattle fits among those top teams like the Saints and Green Bay and the list goes on? Well, I think uh, we've talked about this before. I think if you have Russell Wilson, you have a shot. And the Seahawks are coming off a tough loss to the Giants in Seattle. And, like, if you had asked me who if if I thought the Giants had a chance in that game, truthfully, I probably would have said no. Backup quarterback and Colt McCoy, first-year head coach, first-year defensive coordinator, going out to Seattle to take on the Russell Wilson led Seahawks. I mean, I, I didn't really give the giants a shot and that's, that's my bad because they clearly proved me wrong. And I think to that's answer an impressive your question, victory. Yeah. no doubt to answer your question, where do I think they rank? Well, it's a funny because right now they're the wild card holder because the Rams have the tiebreaker right now over the Seahawks wow. because the Rams beat the Seahawks earlier this season. But I think come week 17, I'm pretty sure the Seahawks have one of the easiest remaining schedules in the NFL record wise, but that doesn't mean that they're gimme games to say the least. And I think that they're definitely, I'm putting them right up there with the saints and who's the other team you said? I said Green Bay because Aaron oh, Rodgers yeah. has went under the radar how good a season A-Rod's had. <laughs> yeah, I think they're right up there. I mean, I think they can compete with anybody. And I really think that Carlos Dunlap changed the landscape of that defensive front. Well, I yeah. mean, are you, you agree with me or you think that they're missing a couple pieces on that defense? Yeah, it's an interesting team to read. Like we talked about early in the season, I would have thought, you know, you would say Seattle might be the team in the NFC, but they had so many holes defensively. Adams was banged up this year. So uh, that trade for Carlos Dunlap, you're right. He's made a difference up front. They do have a former undrafted free agent who uh, made his fame early on in his career with the Jets. Damon Snacks Harrison, he's playing in the middle <laughs> right now. The defense has played better offensively. You're right against the Giants. What you've seen from them of late is they haven't been protecting Russell Wilson. He The sack numbers have been up there. And when I look at the Jets matchup with the Seahawks, Seahawks are going to have a difficult time running the football against the Jets because everybody does. The Raiders were unable to get the run game going. It's going to be, can the Jets have any answers in the air against those weapons you talked about? I think they'll get to the quarterback a number of times. You really like what you're seeing out of Quinn and Williams in the middle of that defense. He's going to press that pocket, and they will get some sacks this week. And I also think they'll contain the run. It's what are they going to do with a new defensive signal caller? How are they going to change some things up to help those guys in the secondary? It's going to be fascinating to see what happens with the Jets, particularly defensively, because of what you just said and because of what we started the show in terms of news. Greg Williams no longer calling plays for this Jets defense, so we don't know what to expect from this Jets defense moving forward. And with that being said, we've talked a lot about the Seahawks' weapons and their players on the defensive side of the ball. One player we have not mentioned is Bobby Wagner, but let's hear from Bart Scott for our Victorinox Swiss Army Knife Player of the Game segment to see who he has his eyes on. Okay, Bart, before we get into our matchups to watch, I'm just curious, your perspective, I think you could shed some light on what it's like inside the locker room when you have a shakeup at the defensive coordinator spot and someone new calling plays. What's that? What's this week going to be like for the Jets' defense? 
That's going to be about getting comfortable with each other and understanding the philosophy and understanding how the defensive coordinator sees certain situations so you can have a level of anticipation about what the call is going to be called in certain situations, whether it's short yardage, goal line, uh, got to have it two-minute situations because sometimes you may or may not have the communication and usually you knowing what he's going to call allows you to maybe be able to problem solve some of those things before they occur, uh, understanding what he believes in, what he wants to call in certain situations. Uh, Matt Backer, we had Neville Hewitt on before you came on for your weekly spot here on the Official Jets Podcast. What have you thought about the play of Neville and his development over the course of the time that he's been here with the New York Jets and now Harvey Longy starting alongside him? And those guys both play with their hair on fire. Nonstop motors have brought a great physicality to the game. Uh, I just wanted to ask you about their development. Well, I think last year Neville um, really uh, turned a corner in the second half of the season when he first got out there. I thought he struggled a little bit, but he started to figure out, you know, the defense where he can take opportunities. And now I think now he has confidence and he's sh- sure of himself. And he plays with a sense of a swagger where before he was playing a little hesitant and maybe a step slow. Like you think about Longby, he's going to have an opportunity to play as well. And he's playing with his hair on fire. Um, but the issue is when C.J. Mosley comes back, you know, they're going to be fighting essentially with each other um, because I don't see C.J. going back and maybe being like that Darren Lee, that, you know, DeMario Davis um, playing space, leave the box type of linebacker. You know, so they're going to be fighting it out. So they're going to have to kind of continue to, to sharpen their skills so that they can. Um, and you think, you know, Blake Cashman, you know, he's the guy essentially that you would think would be the other kind of covered linebacker that leaves the box, but he just can't stay healthy. So I think it's going to be a, uh, environment of, of competition, especially if next year you know you have C.J. Mosley back and you're going to have three guys fighting for one position. It gives you tremendous depth and it gives you the confidence that you've seen them play on both sides and both positions if some somebody goes down. All right, well, let's look ahead to Jet Seahawks. Bart, what is your player or your matchup to watch? I mean, I, I want to see Ty Johnson, right, because we just saw Wayne Gallman go off against the Seattle Seahawks. You know, you talk about, you know, his day and what he had, you know, averaging almost nine yards a carry or, you know, it, it was something ridiculous. I think maybe, you know, maybe he averaged like 6.7. In the, um, you know, you think about getting down here, you talk about going behind, you know, going up Route uh, 77 and that being a path to success. Imagine being able to do that against, you know, the Seattle Seahawks. If you're going to have success, it's about keeping Russell Wilson on the bench. We saw the Giants prove that. Keep, them on, keep him on the bench and make him force him to have to be great you know, the few possessions that you get, take the air out of the ball and hope that you can capitalize and get seven instead of three. Yeah, what is the Jets secondary going to do against DK Metcalf, Tyler Lockett and company? Uh, That to me is the key question. We know they're playing with a lot of young players right now. You're living with the ups and downs. Darren Waller, who we mentioned last week in this spot, that was a key matchup. He had 200 yards receiving against the New York Jets. Metcalf, obviously, a big guy, not a tight end, but he a monstrous player who can get down the field in a hurry. And Russell Wilson is one of the top vertical throwers in the entire National Football League. The Seahawks have had trouble protecting him up front. And also, the Jets have been very good against the run. So how is this secondary with so many moving pieces, so many young guys going to hold up when – that front doesn't get to Wilson. Well, you got to think Carson didn't get the opportunity to get going. I um, mean, really abandoned it because you talk about, you know, having a former giant there, Willer, he was getting, you know, steamrolled. And so you can you know, run the ball that direction. You couldn't hold up in pass protection. So I think that's the, the recipe for success, right? You want to make sure that if you're going to, you know, lose, you know, to Seattle, it's going to be because they run the ball for 300 yards, not because they get these easy scores and these big explosive plays. So, you want to play with, you know, two safeties over the top. You want to have your 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 cornerbacks um, challenge Metcalf at the at the line of scrimmage and understand just stay in front of him and don't let him get started. And then if he does, you still have an opportunity to have the safeties over the top. So you make it a tough physical day for him. You don't give him a play off, and you challenge your corners to challenge him at the line of scrimmage. No belling, no playing five, ten yards off. We're going to get in his chest, and we're going to stay there the entire day. Understanding that it's not just – his ability to catch the ball is also his ability to try and set the edge, you know, in the running game. So you're going to have to compete and scrap there and just, just fight. And that's what you want to see. I, I think this would be a tremendous test for, 
for Bryce Hall. Um, if Blesson is back from the neck injury, you, know, you think about the size, speed. Blesson is a you know a, a, a specimen as well. You know he's a, a, a smaller, thinner guy, but he's wiry. He's cut up. He has he has the strength to be able to maybe get in, in somebody's face, but he still has a defense radius. So it'll be a great matchup. But I think by no means do you go man to man. If you do, it's going to be very limited. So Ethan Bart saying a lot of cover two looks, but that doesn't mean don't get after those receivers. He wants the Jets to get physical at the line of scrimmage. I like it. I like it too, and I feel like. I know Bart's matchup to watch is Ty Johnson, and rightfully so, but I do think that the Seahawks do have holes in their secondary, and when you look at their passing numbers and the amount of points they allow per game, there are going to be opportunities for Sam Darnold in this receiving core that was somewhat limited against the Las Vegas Raiders because of the jobs that Ty Johnson and Josh Adams did on the ground. I feel like the Jets' offense need to is going to need to be efficient when counted on, especially on third down when you need to move the chain. So, Bart, before we let you go here, what is your take on this Jets receiving core against the Seahawks secondary that has some holes in it? Well, you have to understand, they're going to try and, the, the, the Seahawks are going to try and heat the Jets up. I don't think they're trying to heat them up by going on Beckton's side. They're going to go where, you know, the Jets are struggling. That's up the A-gap once again. Every week we come here, we talk about A-gap blitz. When a guy sending a text message, a linebacker standing two yards off the ball in a sprinter stands, not even in a pair, not even in, in, in a balanced stance, he's showing you that he's coming. And yet the Jets didn't make the necessary adjustments pre-snap, post-snap. You know, Johnson didn't get in front to make the block, but you might want to move him over. I understand that's where it's coming or slide the protection, or change the protection, and I understand that the best when you know you get a gap coverage, you know, you don't want to let him go to the running back. Just slide the protection, put the running back on the edge. Why they don't do that, I have no idea, but it continues to haunt them. So imagine Jamal not coming off the edge. If he is, he's coming off your right edge, his left, or he's coming up the middle because that's where you guys have been serving up free set, free sacks. All right, well, that's how we wrap up this edition of the Victorinox Swiss Army Knife Player of the Game segment and another edition of the official Jets podcast powered by AWS. Bart, appreciate the time, as always. My pleasure. Thank Thanks, you. buddy.